Canada's history has always been about various groups competing for resources, but also about how despite occasional violence they have found ways to accommodate multiple interests without having the whole enterprise fall apart. To see why, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of Canada. Our story began some 20,000 years ago when the first Asian immigrants went to Canada. That was when Siberian nomads began crossing a land bridge that used to connect Siberia and Alaska in pursuit of caribou, elk, and bison. After that, there were two other major migration waves from Siberia, around 2500 BCE and 1000 AD respectively. These were the Dorset culture, who centered themselves around Nunavut, Canada, and the Thule people, which are the ancestors of all modern Inuit. The new immigrants spread into five main areas throughout Canada, the Arctic, the Pacific, the Plains, the Southern Ontario St. Lawrence River area, and the Northwest Woodlands. It was groups in this last region that first encountered Europeans, twice. The first were the Vikings under the leadership of Leif Erikson, who around 1000 AD began to establish winter settlements and way stations for repairing ships and restocking supplies, such as that of Lands Omedo in Newfoundland. The indigenous peoples did not like the presence of the newcomers, however, and managed to drive them out. The second time, it would not be so easy. This occurred roughly 500 years later, in 1497, when the British sent Giovanni Caboto, better known as John Cabot, to find our Northwest Passage. That was because news of Columbus's voyages to the Caribbean made it seem as though there really was an easy way to get to China via the Americas. Of course, Cabot did not find it because it did not exist, but he did find cod. Lots of it. This sparked the interest of multiple other European powers who soon began competing for the territory amongst themselves. First came several expeditions from the Portuguese, including that of João Fernandes Labrador in 1498, which the Labrador Peninsula is named after. Next came the French, who sent Giovanni da Verrazzano in 1524 and Jacques Cartier in 1534, 1535, and 1541. Cartier went further into present-day Canadian territory than any other European before him and founded the first settlement in the country at Fort Charlesburg Royal in present-day Quebec. Although it would be abandoned within two years as a result of disease, foul weather, and native attacks, Cartier would leave a more lasting legacy by being instrumental in the naming of Canada. The story goes that on his first voyage, he kidnapped the sons of a St. Lawrence chief, Donna Connor, and when he asked them for the name of their land, they responded, Canada, meaning village in Iroquois. Cartier then used the term not just for the village, but the entire area controlled by the chief. And soon, people were using the term for everything north of the St. Lawrence River. Since Cartier's voyages did not yield either a passage to Asia or any of the riches the French king expected, France began to lose interest. Decades went by with little action until fashion changed the dynamic. Fur hats suddenly became all the rage in Europe, and with it, demand for beaver pelts exploded. Given that European supply was nearly non-existent, but plentiful in Canada, soon the French were back trying to set up Canadian settlements in order to control the fur trade. The first permanent one was Port Royal in Nova Scotia, but far from the fur trade and hard to defend, it soon gave way in importance to Quebec City. Founded by Samuel de Champlain in 1604, it would eventually become the capital of the colony. But in those early days, the population grew so slowly that by 1640, it had a mere 655 souls. Life was hard, but Champlain's shrewd alliances with the native tribes maintained the area in French hands despite a war outbreak between the French and the British in the 1620s. Still, the French monopoly on the fur trade could not last forever. In the 1670s, the British realized the fur trade could be accessed through the Hudson Bay and immediately acted on it. The king granted the Hudson Bay Company a commercial monopoly over the Hudson Bay drainage basin, a territory that became known as Rupert's Land. Given their own claims in the area, this infuriated the French, who responded by encroaching on land claimed by the English. It was the beginning of a conflict that would simmer for the better part of the next century. The following century's competition between the two powers was punctuated by warfare which the French and Quebecois called intercolonial wars. These include King William's War between 1688 and 1697, Queen Anne's War between 1702 and 1713, whose final treaty forced the French to recognize British claims to the Hudson Bay in Newfoundland, King George's War 1744-1748, which saw the capture of the Louisbourg Fortress in Cape Breton Island, and the final and most destructive, the French and Indian War 1759-1763. 
between 1754 and 1763. Considering they were heavily outnumbered, the French held on quite well in this last conflict, but a renewed British offensive under William Pitt in 1758 turned the tide. Despite unlikely victories for the French, like the Battle of Carillon, they began to steadily lose ground. The pivotal blow came in 1759 when the British captured Quebec in one of Canada's bloodiest and most famous battles that left both commanding generals dead. French attempts to regain the city failed, so left without options, the French handed Canada over to Britain in 1763. Managing the newly acquired territory presented quite a challenge for the British. They had to quell uprisings by indigenous people, such as the attack on Detroit by Ottawa chief Pontiac, and figure out what to do with French Canadians. Tensions arose with the Quebecois when the new rulers imposed anti-Catholic laws, including the rights to vote and hold office. The British hoped their discriminatory policy would launch a mass exodus of French Canadians and make it easier to anglicize the remaining settlers. Instead, it backfired. The French further dug in their heels. As if those were not big enough problems, the American colonies started making revolutionary rumbles to the south. The British wisely reasoned that given the situation, it was important to win the allegiance of the French Canadians, so Parliament passed the Quebec Act of 1774. This confirmed French Canadians' right to the religion, allowed them to assume political office, and restored the use of French civil law. While public opinion in the 13 colonies saw this negatively, it had the intended effect in Canada and most French Canadians refused to aid the American cause, although they didn't help the British either. After the revolution, the English-speaking population exploded when some 50,000 settlers from the newly independent U.S. migrated northward. The majority ended up in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. The latter, a new province carved out of the former's territory, in part as a welcome to the newcomers. Meanwhile, a smaller group settled along the northern shore of Lake Ontario and in the Ottawa River Valley, forming the nucleus of what became Ontario. About 8,000 people moved to Quebec, creating the first sizable Anglophone community in the French-speaking bastion. Partly in order to accommodate the interests of the Loyalist settlers, the British government passed the Constitutional Act of 1791, which divided the colony into Upper Canada, today Southern Ontario, and Lower Canada, now Southern Quebec. Lower Canada retained French civil laws, but both provinces were governed by the British Criminal Code. The British Crown installed a governor to direct each colony, who in turn appointed the members of his cabinet, then called the Executive Council. The legislative branch consisted of an appointed legislative council and an elected assembly, which in theory represented the interests of the colonists. In reality, though, the assembly held very little power since the governor could veto its decisions. Not surprisingly, this was a recipe for friction and resentment, especially in Lower Canada, where an English governor and an English-dominated council held sway over a French-dominated assembly. Rampant cronyism made matters even worse. Members of the conservative British merchant elite dominated the executive and legislative councils and showed little interest in French-Canadian matters. Called the Family Compact in Upper Canada and the Chateau Clique in Lower Canada, the ranks included brewer John Molson and university founder James McGill. The group's influence grew especially strong after the War of 1812, an ultimately futile attempt by the U.S. to take over its northern neighbor. In 1837, frustration over these entrenched elites reached a boiling point. Parti Canadien leader Louis-Joseph Papineau and his Upper Canadian counterpart, Reform Party leader William Lyon Mackenzie, launched open rebellions against the government. Although both were quickly crushed and many of the rebels, such as Samuel Lount, were publicly executed, while others were sent to the Australian prison colonies, the uprisings nonetheless completely altered the relationship between the Crown and its Canadian subjects. The British dispatched John Lambton, the Earl of Durham, to investigate the causes of the rebellions. He identified ethnic tensions as the root of the problem, calling the French and British two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. More radically, he asserted that French culture and society were inferior and obstacles to expansion and greatness, and suggested that assimilation of British laws, language, and institutions would quash French nationalism and bring long-lasting peace to the colonies. These ideas were adopted into the Union Act of 1840, which merged Upper and Lower Canada into the province of Canada and became governed by a single Canadian parliament. Each ex-colony had the same number of representatives, which wasn't exactly fair to Lower Canada where the population was much larger. On the plus side, the new system brought responsible government that restricted the governor's powers and eliminated nepotism. Not surprisingly, while most British Canadians welcomed the new system, the French were less than thrilled. 
If anything, the Union's underlying objective of destroying French culture, language, and identity made Francophones cling together even more tenaciously. The provisions of the Act left deep wounds that persist to this day. Thus, the United Province was built on slippery ground. Its first decade after unification was full of instability. Meanwhile, the U.S. had grown into a self-confident economic powerhouse, while British North America was still a loose patchwork of independent colonies. The American Civil War between 1861 and 1865 and the USA's purchase of Alaska from Russia in 1867 raised fears of annexation. It became clear that only a less volatile political system would stave off these challenges, and the movement toward federal union gained momentum. The spark for it occurred in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, when the Atlantic Maritime Provinces came together there in 1864 to try to forge a confederation. The larger province of Canada saw this as an opportunity to both create a stronger government and solve its internal problems. This surprised the Maritime Provinces, but they agreed to discuss a larger confederation. It took several more meetings and a trip to London, but finally Parliament passed the British North America Act three years later. The legislation set up a new self-governing colony called the Dominion of Canada on July 1, 1867, now celebrated as Canada Day. Task 1 on the Infant Dominion's to-do list was to bring the remaining land and colonies into the Confederation, including two that were present in the Confederation discussions, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island. Under its first Prime Minister, John A. MacDonald, the government first acquired Rupert's land in 1869 for the Hudson Bay Company, and in 1873 managed to convince Prince Edward Island to join the Dominion after the country assumed PEI's debts. Rupert's land, now called the Northwest Territories, was only sparsely populated, mostly by Plains First Nations and several thousand Métis, a racial blend of Cree, Ojibwe, or Salto, and French Canadian or Scottish fur traders who spoke French as their main language. Their biggest settlement was the Red River Colony around Fort Garry, today's Winnipeg. The Canadian government immediately clashed with the Métis people over land use rights, causing them to form a provisional government led by the charismatic Louis Riel, who in November 1869 seized control of Upper Fort Garry and sent the Ottawa-appointed governor packing. Despite the fact that Riel executed one of his prisoners and the widespread uproar this caused, the government wanted so much to bring the West into the fold, they agreed to carve out a new province, Manitoba, and granted most of Riel's demands, including special language and religious protections for the Métis. MacDonald still sent troops after Riel, but he narrowly escaped to the U.S., where he was exiled for five years in 1875. British Columbia, created in 1866 by merging the colonies of New Caledonia and Vancouver Island, was the next frontier. The discovery of gold along the Fraser River in 1858 and the Caribou region in 1862 had brought an enormous influx of settlers. Once the gold mines petered out, however, British Columbia was plunged into poverty. In 1871, it joined the Dominion in exchange for the Canadian government assuming all its debt and promising to link it with the East within 10 years via a transcontinental railroad. In the end, it took a bit longer than a decade. The final spike into the track did not come until November 7, 1885, but when it did, it was transformative. Not only was it crucial in unifying the country, it also spurred immigration and stimulated business and manufacturing. Right along with the railroad came the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, better known as Mounties, to bring law and order to the West. While this benefited some groups, the people who very much lost were the indigenous groups who were forced to sign various treaties, relegating them to reserves. Meanwhile, many Métis had moved to Saskatchewan and settled around Batoche. As in Manitoba, they quickly clashed with government surveyors over land issues. In 1884, after the repeated appeals to Ottawa had been ignored, they coaxed Louis Riel out of exile to represent their cause. Rebuffed, Riel responded the only way he knew, by forming a provisional government and leading the Métis in revolt. Riel had the backing of the Cree, but times had changed. With the railroad nearly complete, government troops arrived within days. Riel surrendered in May and was hanged for treason later that year. Canada rang in the 20th century on a high note. Industrialization was in full swing, prospectors had discovered gold in the Yukon, and Canadian resources from wheat to lumber were increasingly in demand. In addition, the new railroad opened the floodgates to immigration. Between 1885 and 1914, about 4.5 million people arrived in Canada. This included large groups of Americans and Eastern Europeans, especially Ukrainians, who went to work cultivating the prairies. 
Optimism reigned, but things were about to be severely tested with the outbreak of World War I. Canada, as a member of the British Empire, found itself automatically drawn into the conflict. In the war's first years, more than 300,000 volunteers went off to European battlefields, but as the war dragged on and deaths mounted, recruitment lagged, forcing the government to introduce a draft in 1917. It proved to be a very unpopular move that fanned the flames of nationalism even more. Thousands of Quebecois took to the streets in protest, and the issue left Canada divided and Canadians distrustful of their government. By the end of the war in 1918, most Canadians were fed up with sending their sons and husbands to fight in distant wars for Britain, under the government of William Lyon Mackenzie King, an eccentric guy who communicated with spirits and worshipped his dead mother, Canada began asserting its independence. Mackenzie King made it clear that Britain could no longer automatically draw upon the Canadian military, started signing treaties without British approval, and sent a Canadian ambassador to Washington. This forcefulness led to the Statute of Westminster, passed by the British Parliament in 1931. The statute formalized independence of Canada and other Commonwealth nations, although Britain retained the right to pass amendments to those countries' constitutions. Oddly, that right remained on the books for another half-century. It was removed only with the 1982 Canada Act, which Queen Elizabeth II signed into law on Parliament Hill in Ottawa on April 17th. Today, Canada is a constitutional monarchy with a parliament consisting of an appointed upper house or senate and an elected lower house, the House of Commons. The British monarch remains Canada's head of state, although this is predominantly a ceremonial role and does not diminish the country's sovereignty. Within Canada, the appointed governor-general is the monarch's representative. The period after World War II brought another wave of economic expansion and immigration, especially from Europe. With Canada growing at roughly 4% a year, Newfoundland, looking for prosperity, finally joined Canada in 1949. The only province truly left behind during the 1950s boom years was Quebec. For a quarter century, it remained in the grip of ultra-conservative Maurice Duplessis and his Union Nationale party. Only after Duplessis' death did the province finally start getting up to speed during the Quiet Revolution of the 1960s. Advances included expanding the public sector, investing in public education, and nationalizing the provincial hydroelectric companies. Still, progress wasn't swift enough for radical nationalists who claimed independence was the only way to ensure francophone rights. Since then, the province has been flirting with separatism. The most extreme example was in 1995, when they had a referendum on separating from Canada, which separatists barely lost. In 1960, Canada's indigenous peoples were finally granted Canadian citizenship. Issues involving land rights and discrimination played out in the decades that followed. In 1990, indigenous frustration reached a boiling point with the Oka Crisis, a standoff between the government and a group of Mohawk activists near Montreal. The conflict was set off by a land claim. The town of Oka wanted to use land that the Mohawk considered sacred. A 78-day clash ensued and one policeman died of gunshot wounds. The event shook Canada. In the aftermath, the government tried to overhaul its relationship with indigenous peoples. In 1998, the Ministry of Indian and Northern Affairs issued an official statement of reconciliation that accepted responsibility for past injustices towards indigenous people. In 1999, the government created a new territory of Nunavut and handed it over to the Inuit people, who have long lived in the northern region, and in 2008, the government apologized for the residential system that took away indigenous children from their families in an effort to assimilate them into the dominant Canadian culture. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. In 1985, Canada became the first country in the world to pass a national multicultural act. Today, more than 20% of Canada's population is foreign-born and its immigration policy continues to be much more flexible than its neighbor to the south. Meanwhile, throughout its entire history, Canada has always been ruled by either the Liberal Party or some version of a Conservative Party. Currently, its Prime Minister is a Liberal, Justin Trudeau, whose greatest challenge by far has been dealing with the COVID pandemic. Although far from perfect, the country did manage it better than its American neighbor, with a significantly lower death rate, and also seems to have put the worst of the COVID economic disruption behind it. Between 2000 and 2019, Canada's economy grew at a stable rate of 3% a year, before falling off a cliff in 2020. As of yet, it is unclear whether the country will return to the previous trend. Meanwhile, 
tolerance has marched onward, with gay marriage and marijuana both being legalized in 2005 and 2018 respectively. It's the Canadian way, and it looks to continue for a while yet.